I'm Carson Block and welcome to A Short Story. I'm pleased to be joined this time by Chris Brown of Aristides Capital. Chris Brown and Aristides are literally one of the best in the world at equity long short. They've compounded at about 15% a year since 2008 and have never had a down year. And having a significant short book is a big part of what Aristides does. Chris, thrilled to have you here. I, I know we're going to learn a lot. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Carson. Uh, thanks for having me. There's a lot that's outside the box here. And to be, to be clear to our viewers, um, this is actually going to be a great opportunity for me to get to know you as well, because we've never spoken before. Uh, we had one or two exchanges over DM, ironically, not <laughs> having anything to do with investing. You're in Toledo, Ohio, which is also unusual for a fund manager. Um, how did you get here? Yeah, um, I had a really, I guess, non-traditional background uh, for a hedge fund manager. Um, I used to be a doctor in the Air Force uh, prior to 2008. I was, a, you know, kind of, I guess, a math and science kid, and uh, I was, uh, I, I was an Aspie, and so I would go um, from from one thing that I was really into to another. When I was in uh, second grade, I actually kind of compulsively watched Financial News Network and really got into the markets. Um, at that point. So traded my first stock when I was 12. In medical school, we started an investment club. And actually, uh, in 99, I ended up starting a uh, state registered investment advisor slash commodity trading advisor um, during my second year of medical school. And I kind of realized at that point that medicine was maybe the, not the ideal career for me and that uh, the markets were kind of a lot more fun. Um, unfortunately, I had an Air Force uh, HPSP scholarship to medical school, and so um, I asked the Air Force if it was possible to pay them back and leave school, and they said, only if you want to come be a line officer in the Air Force for four years. Finished school, uh, did a military internal medicine residency at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, in Dayton, stayed on there uh, as chief resident for a year. Then I served as site clerkship director for Uniform Services University for three years. And in early 2007, I started thinking about what I wanted to do when I got out of the military in the summer of 08. Um, and I came across a great uh, back testable database product, uh, built my first quant strategy uh, in US microcap and started trading that. It's going really well. And I thought, you know, I could, I could do this for other people. Spent some time finding service providers and, and uh, taking my Series 65 and, and reading uh, as much as I could and getting up to speed. And we launched the fund in August of 2008. In terms of going back to your background, doctor, and you said uh, also Aspie, so I assume you're referring to Asperger's. Um, so how often do you get compared to Michael Burry, and how annoying is it? <laughs> um, you know, not, early on, uh, a little bit, like when, when the big short first came out. I mean, it would be a very superficial comparison, I think. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty different. I, mean, I think, you know, our politics are pretty different. You know, there, there's got to be I mean, something in your background. So, okay, obviously, you've got a mind that's well geared to quantitative analysis, to science. But, you know, when you look at that, I wouldn't say that's necessarily every doctor. Um, I mean, doctors, I think, are notorious for being really bad investors, bad business people. I think they were always like the easy marks of those boiler room brokerage firms in the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, I think that was like the, the big payday was getting through to a doctor. You know, and also, I mean, we've looked at times at some uh, biotech names that have had when you scrape, when you really get into the clinical trial data, you see that the clinical trial data does not show efficacy. And yet a lot of doctors, when we've spoken to them, um, you know, they're really, it's surprisingly based on intuition and anecdotal data. Like, well, this is what I observed. How much does medicine or being in medicine, that, that branch of science, how much does that really set you up for investing or is this somewhat just a coincidence? The medical background can be uh, both helpful and it can be a detriment. Um, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that doctors do tend to use a lot of intuition. For back from my medical education days, trying to teach uh, you know, other physicians about 
evidence-based medicine and about statistics was like pulling teeth. Like math is particularly hard for doctors. Teaching people to think in a Bayesian way and to be uncomfortable with um, uncertainty is, is hard, not for every doctor, but certainly for a lot of them. I would say the medical background is helpful sometimes in that one of our shorts that we've been a little bit public on recently is a company called Cytodyne, where they're, they have a very old, a very old drug from 1999 that they've basically repurposed as a snake oil. And uh, you know, CCR5 is a very popular uh, target for pharmaceuticals right now. And so, you know, they're like, our, our drug is going to be good for cancer and for NASH and for COVID and for a million things. And, and actually, like, knowing the pharmacology and being able to look back to the original studies, you know, you can look and you can see, oh, this, uh, the IC50 at this receptor is X, and the way they're dosing this medicine, the serum concentration is actually less than X. And so, you know, whereas most drugs, you'd have like 98, 99% receptor blockade, you know, this drug is, is blocking, you know, less than 50% of the receptor activity. So it's, ba it's basically worthless as a drug. Knowing that is, you know, is really helpful. The things that have hurt me being a doctor, number one, the times that you get caught up in data rather than the basics of, I guess some of the things you learn as a long short manager, you know, like whether management is trustworthy or not. Um, so I've definitely had some misses before where I've been too trusting of management. Um, and I haven't paid it. I've, I've been more immersed in the data and less in the fact that it's a, a Salt Lake City based company, which maybe, you know, I should have been. And then last year, you know, COVID was just, uh, it, it's funny, unfortunately, you know, I really nailed both the infection fatality rate and kind of the, the course of the COVID cases would take. Um, even in March, we had a, a gigantic one by two in the VIX because it was like super obvious that November, December, there'd be this huge ramp in COVID cases again. And I was just like so caught up in COVID that I was not sufficiently caught up in, you know, how much money was being thrown at the system. And that was you know, definitely a mistake. Like we were way too close to, uh, to market neutral for a lot of that time last year. And so, you know, being able to like focus on the right things is definitely important. And that's, I guess that's a, that's an Aspie downfall, right? Is, is you tend to perhaps sometimes focus on narrow parts of systems instead of seeing the whole thing. I fault my, my own performance last year um, at the precipice of COVID for somewhat of similar reason. Um, I got the toilet paper trade right. I mean, I nailed that. February 12th, I'm you know ordering all the toilet paper, paper towels, canned food, powdered milk, got all that delivered. But And we had a decent month in March when I was stunned at the end of at the end of uh, at the end of February, I read about this uh, Evercore survey of their institutional clients. Pretty much everybody thought that COVID would be a non-event in terms of the economy. So that's when we said, okay, we have to go short. But you know, we didn't. We we should have hit it out of the park like Ackman did. I mean, we had a good month, but just knowing how early I was on the toilet paper trade and how focused I was just on survival as opposed to stepping back and thinking, okay, what are the market implications here? I almost felt myself as being maybe too emotional and not dispassionate enough to say, stop thinking about like how you, your family are going to live here. Start thinking about, you know, how you can make money for your clients. That's funny. Like one of the lessons that I took away from it, I, you know, I'm, I'm always like very sensitive to whether the market is telling me that I'm right or not. Um, and I think one of my takeaways from last year is at certain times, like if you really have conviction in a trade, especially if there's cheap optionality that you can buy, you need to not always be sensitive to what the market's telling you. We actually, we lost a good chunk of money in February VIX last year. Um, cause that, I mean, that was like, you know, talk about being early on the toilet paper trade. Like we had, I think we lost 40 or 50 basis points in February VIX calls. Um, and that would have just been a killer trade if I'd had the conviction to re-up that for March. And instead, I just kind of retreated and said, you know, all right, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why the market's still, you know, not trading off of this. We had kind of a terrible start to last year anyway, because we, we had just implemented um, a traditional quant strategy, this kind of long value, uh, short growth by nature. And so even pre-COVID, January and February were just awful for us. I, I, it's, it's crazy how much being right-footed or wrong-footed 
uh, plays into the decisions you make in the market. You know, if you're if you're on the wrong foot and you're down on a bad day, you're just so likely to chase and do the wrong trades. Um, and when things are when things are really going your way, it's just so easy to take profits where you need to and, and lay out new positions where you need to. Have you ever read that book, um, The Hour Between Dog and Wolf? Okay, it was written by, I think, a, uh, a neurophysicist, and he became that after he was a credit derivatives trader. So it focuses a lot on how the hormones that our body produces in response to success, so testosterone rushes, or in response to stress and failure, cortisol, impact our decision making. And so you can get in these feedback loops, especially when you've been wrong, where your decision making is overly influenced by the presence of cortisol that you've produced because of your mistakes. Whereas, you know, on the flip side, when you've had success and your body's just producing more and more testosterone, what that ends up leading to usually is taking uh, too much risk for too little upside. So it's, uh, it's a physiological explanation for why that is, I suppose. You've talked about how when you first started managing money, you were looking at, you had a quantitative strategy. And I know you still run a quantitative strategy, but I think a lot of what you do right now is also qualitative or non-quantitative. I mean, that's really unique also. I, I, I don't know many people who, who blends that well. So I'd, I'd love to understand, I mean, to the extent that you're willing to talk about it, and what your your quantitative strategy is, or at least what it was at the outset, the principles there, and how you were able to, how you look at things qualitatively, and are these just two entirely different ways of analysis, or is there more overlap there than um, I would suspect? I guess second part first, I, th I think there's a lot of overlap in um, some of the ways we look at companies that the, you know, kind of the traditional, the tr traditional factors that, you know, O'Shaughnessy wrote about in his book, which a, a lot of which are in our traditional quant strategy that we, we, um, brought out in 2019, those have always like heavily influenced my fundamental thinking about investments. And so, I mean, I think the idea that you want a company that has kind of consistently higher returns on capital and lots of profitability and you know those are those those are kind of like common sense things whether you're going at, at things from from a fundamental or a, or a more quantitative aspect without getting into the specific details of of our initial quant strategy because we're still it's still kind of a little bit of a trade secret i will say one of the things we did there is we took you know a, a known well described academic phenomenon and we basically drill down to see like, is there a set of stocks that this works particularly well for? That's kind of been a recurring theme with a lot of our quant strategies at the firm is, is looking for things that are known phenomena rather than trying to have to invent something ourselves and then basically trying to find an elegant implementation of that. You know, one of the nice things about only managing, you know, $140 million at this point is that you know, if, if a strategy can accommodate five or $10 million, it's still an interesting strategy to us. Whereas, you know, obviously if you're a $3 billion fund, then, then that's not going to be worth your time. But the flip side of that, and um, really when you look at, at the short side, I mean, running, running a short book, um, the, the economics of that are often quite bad because you really need a minimum capital base most cases to do the fundamental research. Um, and that's, so you like the, uh, like other short sellers who actually stay in business, you run about, you know, I, I think about 80 short positions, give or take, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty diverse book. Yeah. I don't know if it's that or something on, on that order. Yeah. Like I said, there, there are people who come into the business who try to be more concentrated, who think that, you know, we're just going to really research these things and be right. But you know, unfortunately, being right and making money, especially on the short side, are not always the same thing. So when you when you think about having to have dozens of names on the short side, that's the bottom of your funnel. The top of your funnel, uh, at the top of the funnel for that normally would be enormous. And so I remember years ago when I first met Jim Chanos and he was explaining that that's how they run their book. And I was just thinking, my God, like how... You know, the, the amount of processing that must go to 
you know, get you to 60 to 80 names, you know, to take it from the top of the funnel. Now, that's something that, at, you know, that he was able to do as a multi-billion dollar fund. And he had the processing power in the form of people. You, I'm assuming, don't run nearly as big as, as Kinecos uh, does. So I'm assuming that there's a lot you do with your with quantitatively or screening uh, in order to you know work that process down. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not you know we're not a quintessential or a Hindenburg where we're doing multiple hundreds of hours investigations on companies. It's just beyond the the resources that we have. Our basic philosophy. To, it's it's funny because we we tried that once. I mean, we we actually tried to do some activist work on Montage, the the Chinese set top box fraud. We put a tremendous amount of work into it. Had a very large put position, and I think it was about a three hundred basis point drag on our portfolio that year. And I said, you know, that's. It's not a really good investment um, of our time. Our philosophy of sorting has uh, has usually been why fight Mike Tyson when you can kick grandma in the shins? With the exception of the last 12 months uh, prior to the last month, um, that that has been a really good strategy. And unfortunately, you know, last year you saw grandma took some methamphetamines and, and was, was raging and, um, you know, collecting cash and knocking people out. So it was, uh, it was a really interesting time. I mean, we've obviously seen that revert very dramatically uh, since early February. What are the kinds of things that you short? And do you, do you look for shorts that you feel are going to be good beta hedges against your long book, or you just look at shorts basically de novo? What are the things that I think are going to go down? Where are the, the grandmas who haven't seen their drug dealers in a while? <laughs> Um, you know, rather embarrassingly, I, I hadn't really thought about um, thought about quant factor hedging in the book much at all, and it's still like not it's not something that we really actively seek to do very much. I look at almost the longs and the shorts as two different um, you know two different processes, and I'm trying to generate alpha from both of them. Um, and unfortunately, as as uh, you know, 2020 kind of laid bare, like you definitely in an unusual environment, like in a 98 to 2000 or a 2020 kind of environment, you do have a very significant factor risk um, when that's, you know, you basically got the same factor risk on both the long and the short side. The bright side, you know, when you get months like last month or this month, all of a sudden you've got, you know, the same good uh, factor exposure on, on both sides. So it's a happier situation. But yeah, we're looking for companies that um, have, have promised something that they can't possibly do, um, that have a very excited investor base that's um, you know, very excited but not particularly knowledgeable and, and doesn't yet realize that management can't do the thing that they've promised they can do. Generally trading at a very high uh, enterprise value to revenue um, and generally losing a lot, burning a lot of cash and dependent on future financing. Generally, those things tend to burn themselves out. Do you have a, a sweet spot in terms of market cap or really all over? You know, historically, I would say it was very challenging to find big companies that that, that met those criteria. Um, and then, you know, kind of recently, I, I, I don't know, I think you might have seen our presentation on Tilray from a couple of years back, but Tilray was maybe like a harbinger that this was this, that this market might might turn, you know, dot com mania again. This is definitely a commodity business. Growing marijuana, reselling marijuana, extracting marijuana is all very commodity. Yes, you can point to niche markets within marijuana that are not commodity, but the big picture here is price comes down over time and it comes down aggressively. I'd say the biggest risk to our short thesis is someone making another brutally stupid $4 billion investment. Uh, I'm not sure why Constellation did this. Um, Hopefully it doesn't happen again. I think by this point, people are less excited about the space and hopefully have figured out um, you know, that that's not a good allocation of $4 billion. You really had not seen very many companies that were almost revenueless um, you know, outside of the biopharma space trade you know, to the kind of valuations that Tilray had. That was a great setup for us in that you know, when, you, when you get a company that's that ridiculously overpriced, it's still losing lots of money and doesn't really have you know, any sort of moat, um, that's a really good setup. So historically, I'd say a lot of our shorts had been you know, in the two to $500 million market cap range. 
Um, they definitely started to go up market cap a bit with Tilray. Recently, you know, just given how things have run, it's been very challenging to short anything that's really under 500 million or a billion just because there's so much potential for, you know, it, you, you don't want it to be the Reddit stock du jour and have it trade, you know, 20 times its float in a day and, and be up, you know, 300% on you. It sounded a moment ago like most of the stocks that you traditionally focus on from the short side have a largely retail shareholder base. Absolutely. You talk then about how the shareholders are overly enthusiastic relative to what the company actually can do. And that was one of the really painful things, you know, from 2020 and until I guess very recently in 2021 is that, I mean, this enthusiasm bubble didn't burst. It's it was, it was <laughs> quite sustained. It just grows from more to more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what... What bursts enthusiasm bubbles? Um, I mean, it's fine to do that, but you know, if you're not speaking out loud, I mean, what what bursts the enthusiasm bubbles? Losing money bursts the enthusiasm bubble. So, you know, Tesla was this great uh, doomsday machine for the shorts, and it, I think Tesla is where the gamma squeeze was perfected. It's absolutely insane the extent to which. You know, options dealer gamma. Um, it, you know, as a, as a percent of like daily trading volume, uh, options dealer gamma is a very, very, very significant force in how Tesla trades every day. If you get these incremental inflows of retail call buyers, the thing just goes up, and if you get you know incremental outflows, it goes down. And and there's and there's times when that doesn't necessarily hold true. I mean, obviously you've got to model it out. I think that that was where people discovered, hey, if we if we pour a lot of money into calls, things tend to go up. Um, and when they do go up, you know, it it makes everyone's uh, everyone's account balances a lot larger, and then they have more buying power to uh, you know to throw at other things. And so, and event and eventually, people kind of got bored of Tesla, and they're like, well, there's yeah, there's there's smaller float things that we can make move much faster that are much more exciting to trade. Retail enthusiasm made those go up as well. Um, and it's a very, you know, it's a very pro-cyclical process, obviously. And I think that's that's why you saw the the implied volatility of a GameStop go to like a thousand eventually. Is as things go higher and higher, it's kind of a self-reinforcing process, and the vols go to the moon. And um, and then at some point, uh, you know, people have, uh, you know, that that lesson is learned. Like if I if I buy every dip, I'm good. And then and then they buy. A dip and they have a catastrophic loss someday. You know, when you t when you take that forty or fifty percent loss, it just totally changes the psychology of it. I think. You know, obviously, you'd never say never in the markets, but I think, you know, I for one would be absolutely shocked if we, you know, rally back to new highs in some of these growth names. I mean, that would be like a remarkable, remarkable thing to see. I think, you know, it's reasonable to expect some sort of bounce, but you, you know, you got to think that. Uh, when people take the sort of losses they have in some of the speculative names recently, um, that's got to change psychology.